agree with you. Hey, good morning, church. It is so good to see you this morning. Wow, a lot more people than I expected. I was thinking maybe three or four in the front row, but hey, this is great. Good to see you. Happy 4th of July. Yeah. What is your favorite thing to do on the 4th of July? What do you like to do? What's that? Barbecue. Eat food. So somebody's probably got their meat smoker going. Some kids are thinking about hot dogs, pie. I love fireworks. That is my thing on the 4th of July. I love watching fireworks. In fact, tonight, I hope that the rain holds off because we live across from Champions and the park there, and there's going to be fireworks tonight. So what we traditionally do, or what I traditionally do, my family kind of goes along with me, but I like to watch it like something like the Capitol Fourth, where I can see the fireworks in D.C., and then go and look at them outside. And uh, when we lived in Capel, so it was difficult to get to that place after watching them on TV, so we'd watch them out my son's bedroom window, and we had to kind of lean funny because there's a tree on the next street that kind of blocks everything, and every year I kind of plotted in my mind, I'm gonna go cut down that tree, so next year, We'll be able to watch it. But I love, I love fireworks. I love the 4th of July. And um, incredible. 245 years, 245 years, that's if you start with 1776. This nation's been in existence 240, well, you can go back to when people first started coming over. You can go a century or more later, earlier, I guess. But 245 years. Incredible. Yeah. And let me reflect on this for just a few moments because this was not an immediate thing that happened. There was a lot of struggle and strife to establish the country. It was formed over time. And, and talk about trying to get, bring people together of different backgrounds from across the waters into a place of indigenous peoples and try and form them together. A work in progress, you'd call this nation and still a work in progress. And some might look at this nation today and say, it doesn't look so good. Because if all you watch is the news and on social media, you're gonna see all kinds of samples of things that suggest that maybe this is no longer a work in progress, but a work that's falling apart. There's distrust of leaders, deconstruction attempts at institutions because they're not trusted to do what they're supposed to do. There's anger and deep-seated anger, and we've seen over the last year riots and things that caused us to think, are people really united? There's criticism um, and a short fuse that people have. They're quick to criticize leaders. And even when you watch what's called the news, you see people arguing back and forth upon whether or not they actually like the people that are in charge or like each other. And there's a short-term shallowness that you can see, that people want change to happen immediately and do it my way and not your way. If you were on the outside looking in, you might think that America has a people so divided that it's hard to tell whether democracy is even working. But hey, 245 years and counting. These beautiful words, this great vision that was in the Constitution, the first words, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. That was the idea. But it's based on a big principle. And this principle is this, that you have a society formed of independent people who absolutely are dependent on individuals working together for a greater good than themselves. That's what those words mean. Which brings us to the book of Ephesians, which is what we've been reading together. And I want you to recall, if you've been here, I want you to recall what we've been learning about what God established in the church of Jesus Christ, what he established for his church. And, and Paul in Ephesians writes about this, and he puts grand words together to talk about what God has done. So, for example, in Ephesians 3, 
or in Ephesians 2, I'm sorry, he describes this, that when Christ brought peoples together, Jews and Gentiles, he did this that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put hostility to death. It says, so then you are no longer, those of us that are in Christ, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And listen to this, with Christ himself at the cornerstone, in him the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Amazing, amazing to think about the work that God's doing. And we've been reading about in Ephesians 4 how this work is being accomplished. Ephesians 4 talks about that we all, those in Christ, are called to one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And the goal is that we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, and that we mature together And then last week, Pastor Jason preached from Ephesians 4 about the new self, the new man that we are to leave behind in Christ, our old self, and that we're to focus on the new self that that God has made. No guessing at all in Scripture, this is God's handiwork, his church. And almost 2,000 years and counting from Ephesus and the other early churches right here to First Baptist Church Bernie here today, God at work, crafting his church. But this too is a work in progress. So I want to talk this morning about, or I want to take us through the next section of Ephesians, uh, verses 25 through 32 and talk about how this is being done, practical ways that God is accomplishing this work through us. But let's look at this as, just to get you a little hungry for later today, a theological sandwich. It's a theologically practical sandwich. So the bottom layer of the sandwich is at the end of what Pastor Jason preached on, it's Ephesians 4, 24, where he said this, Paul wrote this, to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness. That takes us all the way back to Genesis 1, where God said, let us make man in our image. So Paul is saying that that's the work that's going on in the church, that the new self is according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Well, let's get the top slice of the sandwich on this bread, and go to Ephesians 5, verse 1, where he says, therefore, be imitators of God, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. So our new selves in Christ, when we came to faith in Christ Jesus, our new selves are shaped in the likeness of God and collectively in this church, in the holy temple, we're to become imitators, actually live as imitators of God. That's the top of the bread, the bottom of the bread. And in the middle, verses 25 through 32, Paul gives us this incredibly practical way to do that. Because in theory, Those verses sound great, but in practice, how do you actually get these new selves to become imitators of God, to walk that way? Ah, what's in the middle, where Paul describes these six layers. So let me read to you this whole passage, and then we're going to walk through it carefully. So starting in verse 24, put on the new man who's been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth. Now, as we get started, I want you to watch carefully what's going on here, because there's a do or there's a don't, followed by a do and then a purpose, a why. Just like a parent talking to his children, don't do this, do that, and then why. So listen, therefore, laying aside falsehood, 
Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, work, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word come from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly beloved children and live in love, just as Christ loved you and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So 25 to 32, six very direct, practical, well, at least the first four are, practical ways that we can practice and become more and more imitators of God, God bearers. Now watch for this, this greater purpose, because that's really what we're going to focus on this passage, this greater purpose. We're going to hear the do's or the don'ts and the do's, but then the purpose, this greater purpose, because the greater purpose in each one of these four main ideas, these four main practices, these very practical things, has everything to do with the greater work that God's doing in building his church. Let me say that again. The greater purpose of each practice has everything to do with the greater work that God is building right here in First Baptist Church, Bernie. So the greater purpose is really what we want to pay attention to. And I'll tell you why. That's because these practices are not for me or you to become a better Christian. These practices are for others. These practices are focused on the others that I'm around and you're around in this church for accountability and for encouragement. That's the greater purpose. So let's look at these first four, which are very, very practical. We'll go through them carefully and deeply. They're very practical, but Paul's not specific about how to do these four. So it takes discernment and some maturity to figure out what does he really mean by these things? How do I practice these things? But along the way this morning, I'll try and give you some examples. And then you're going to be thinking about this, hopefully, when we finish today. And when we prepare for the Lord's Supper together in just a few minutes. All right, so that's enough prelude, preacher. Let's get into this. Let's get into them. So number one, number one, adopt the purposeful practice of fidelity, of trust. This is verse 25. Therefore, having laid aside falsehood, each one of you speak the truth to his neighbor because... We are members of one another. Now, the don't is pretty obvious. Don't lie. See, lies are a part of our sinful nature. They're part of that old self, that old man. It's when you hide how you're living from someone. You act like on the outside, you're behaving as God desires for you to. You're behaving, you're behaving with others in your life as one of truth, but really you're doing things that you're trying to hide. You're lying about who you are. When you're ashamed to admit what you believe, to boldly and directly talk about the gospel, that's living a lie. When you avoid having difficult conversations with people, you just don't want to talk to them about something, that's also falsehood. Lies unravel trust. Truth builds trust. 
And what is the church of Jesus Christ if it's not built on trust of one another? So here's the do. It's pretty simple. Tell the truth. Act the truth. Sometimes that involves hard truths. Paul says early in Ephesians, speak the truth in love. He's talking not only about communicating the gospel, but he's talking about telling someone, addressing someone who needs to hear the truth in contrast to how they're living, and you do that in love. Corrective truths. Confessional truths. When you've done something that violates the relationship you have with someone else, you need to confess that. Not just, oh, well, I lied, but, you know, nobody really noticed, and he doesn't know or she doesn't know, and so it's over. No. Confessional truths are confessing that you've done something because you want to reestablish that trust, that relationship, right? My wife, when I was, before we were married, I, uh, I was intending to, at some point, ask her to marry me. Um, and this was the first really serious relationship that I was in, first one that I had really behaved well in, let's put it that way. And I knew, there came a point one day where I knew there were things about me that she needed to know. And I was really afraid if I tell her these things, she's not gonna have, want to have anything to do with me. But I knew the right thing to do was build this relationship on trust. So I confessed things in my life that I believe she needed to know. And guess what? She didn't run away. Which was, I think, my first human experience with what unconditional love looks like. In a relationship, if you've, if you've transgressed that relationship, confessional truth is a necessary practice. Is that not right? The purpose is because we are not independent agents. <laughs> we are members of one another. We're interdependent. He says that right here. Because we are members of one another, we must speak the truth. Without truth, no trust. Without trust, no family. And what God desires to accomplish in this and through this is impossible unless we're practicing this. In a few moments, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And this is a visible and corporate act of worship. As you approach the table, take inventory. Are you living the truth with your neighbor? Is there something that you need to repair in your relationship? Well, let's keep moving on. Uh, otherwise, the next crowd's going to be wondering, what's going on in there? They just keep going. Second, Paul says, adopt the purposeful practice of anger management. This is interesting. Listen, this is, this is a very perplexing verse. Be angry, yet do not sin. Be angry, yet do not sin. Don't let the sun go down your anger, and don't give the devil an opportunity. The don't is, don't let anger become sinful. At times, there is, there is, I guess, an acceptable anger. I think about Jesus uh, at the temple with the money changers and overturning the tables because they were taking advantage of, of um, the holiness of the temple for profit. I think of Paul writing his letter to the Corinthian church about the destructive sin that was among them and him surprised that they're not doing something about that. But there's sinful anger. And sinful anger happens when your pride is injured and you get angry. Or you don't want to forgive someone. You can't find the way to forgive someone. Watch out, because sinful anger can become sustained anger, where it just festers in you, breeds bitterness, spreads gossip, produces hatred where you avoid others 
avoid others in the fellowship of the body of Christ? Yeah, happens. Or instead of when someone's coming to you, you exhale because you like being around them. You inhale, you're... Oh. Creates a bad reputation in the family when you're angry like that or when believers are angry with one another. And it creates a bad reputation outside the family. When those outside hear what's going on in that church, they really seem not to like one another. The do is very simple. So Paul says, don't let the sun go down your anger. Reconcile as soon as possible. Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about that. He said, when you're angry at your brother, go and take care of that. Don't come before me until you've taken care of that. The purpose is to put a body check on the devil. He says, don't give the devil an opportunity. You know what the devil desires? You know what Satan desires is that the church fails. That believers are so opposed to one another that the church doesn't work anymore. He desires splitting up, schism, falling apart. He wants the church to fail. And anger is such a right place when believers don't like each other, when they despise each other, when they can't forgive one another. That's the perfect opportunity for Satan to have his way. Oh, good. There's one off the map. In a few moments, we're going to be taking Lord's Supper together. As we approach it, I want you to think about this. Are you harboring anger against anyone in the fellowship? The third, adopt the purposeful practice of earning for one another's needs. Paul says, he who steals must steal no longer. But rather, he must labor performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one in need. The don't is stealing. Now, I don't expect that anyone here is a thief. Hopefully not. Let me give you an interesting illustration, something that's happening in our culture. On May 7th, the systems of Colonial Pipeline were halted for 5,500 miles of pipeline due to ransomware. So hackers, a group, uh, got into their system and demanded that theirs were going to be shut down until they gave them money. How much work and how much risk was there for cy the cyber thieves that were behind this? Can you imagine? I mean, they could be doing really valuable work with that skill and intelligence, and yet here they are investing all this work at great risk to try and steal Well, hopefully that's not anybody in this room, but Paul gives a warning about coming to the Lord's Supper. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, when you come together then, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Here's the warning. Or you do, do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have Nothing. The do is to work for good. Not only to work, but to work so that you can do good. Find something to do where you can earn a buck and then help others. Instead of concocting ways to take something from others, to help others. That's the greater purpose that Paul gives in this message. Give to the Lord for others. Think about your profession. Whatever you do uh, that's good and profitable, do you think about how you can help those that are in need with what God is providing you? We, uh, uh, as you give here to the church, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about how to invest that money so that others can reach, we can reach the gospel with others, how we can care for those in need. Um, we try, the leadership here, to steward those funds very, very carefully. But it begins with each one of us and taking an inventory of what God has provided to us and thinking, how can I help someone in need? 
How can I help someone in need? I don't want to be at the Lord's table and know that there's a need that someone has that I might be able to meet. So as you approach the Lord's Supper, think carefully. Are you partaking for yourself or denying the need of your neighbor? Well, there's three. Truth-telling, managing your anger and seeking reconciliation, and providing for those in need. Here's the fourth, very practical. Adopt a purposeful practice of grace filled speech. And in a minute, I'm going to teach you a brand new word, so pay attention. But here's Paul's words. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is good for the edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So there's the don't. The don't is no corrosive speech. You know what corrosion is, right? Corrosion is a process of, of decay on a material caused by a chemical reaction with its environment. There's my science moment. That's about as deep as I can get. Corrosion can kill anything from a small bolt to a 100-ton cargo ship. It has that effect. Something that is foreign hits the environment, it's exposed, that thing is exposed to it, and, and it begins to corrode. Unwholesome words are like that. Unwholesome words can be corrosive. A continuous barrage of graceless speech corrodes a relationship. You should have confidence and not criticism of what God is doing in others. You shouldn't have words that beat someone down. And uh, I got to confess to you here, this is my greatest temptation recently. Um, I need to appeal to you for a sense of accountability. I often say things about others without thinking about them, without thinking about building them up. I'm a critic. I have that, that in me that I love for the Lord to root out, and I love to have your accountability for it. Here's the do. Edifying words. That's what Paul talked about in, earlier in Ephesians 4, that we're to mature together, we're to build each other up. And words have a powerful effect on doing that. You know the word linguistics? Let me propose a new word for you. Linguistics. Words that are filled with grace. Um, that when you are going to speak to somebody, you're thinking about how you can encourage them. Even words of correction can be filled with grace. The purpose is great. It's to build up your brother or sister. It's developing a mind muscle to publicly speak grace without even having to think about it. There's someone I've met in this church who's like that. He's been like that for me, that when I hear him talk, it's always words of encouragement, always words filled with grace. And it's great to have an example like that in your life, but become that for others. Think about Think about, before you speak, think about what you can say to someone that's encouraging, that will help them, even if it's a word of slight rebuke. Think about how that leads to grace, how that can be gracious. As we draw closer to the Lord's Supper, take inventory. Are your words to or about your neighbor corrosive? Pray about that. Well, there are the four big practical do's. Do the don'ts, and you are breaking down the foundation the Lord's established in his church. Do the do's, and you're putting sealant on the bricks. The Lord's put us together, and you're sealing it even stronger, the bonds of fellowship that we have in Christ. Well, then he moves to something on a higher level in verse 30, Adopt the purposeful practice of spirit reflection. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, that's the passage, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
The don't is don't grieve the spirit. He is the power source for everything that happens in the church. And these four practical purposes, practical principles we've been talking about are fueled by the work of the spirit. Think about uh, you as a parent or as a boss or as a leader. And think about how if you're trying to help someone, so you're in giving them intentional instruction and guidance so that uh, they will be able to develop and they ignore it or they reject it. Do children ever do that? Yeah. Think about how you feel. All I'm trying to do is help them. Well, that's what the Spirit's doing. He's at work trying to grow and build and develop this church, develop the unity in this church, develop its visible presence in the world. And he's at work among every, in every interaction that we have with one another, forming our fidelity and our trust to one, with one another, um, curbing anger that we have, uh, surfacing others' needs, and, and through scripture, helping to give us grace-filled words. He's there to accomplish all that in each of us and in our relationships with one another. And if we're fighting that, that grieves him. That grieves God's spirit. The do is, because this is happening invisibly, we can't see his work. And the work is beyond his comprehension, beyond our comprehension, to do is very simply be attentive. Be attentive of the Spirit's work in the church. Be attentive. Be prayerful. And guess what? Back to verse 27 where we talked about anger and how that gives the devil a foothold. We're combating against that. Later in Ephesians 6, we're going to hear about that, that work going on at a, at a level that we can't see, that spiritual work, that spiritual battle that's happening. But we want to be attentive to the Spirit. And we want to be aware that Satan is seeking to get a foothold. And how we act among one another, how we act with one another, how we follow these practices in our speech, in our truth-telling, um, in our caring for others, that's all helping the Spirit to accomplish the work that the Spirit's doing in, in the church. Through the Spirit's work, God is putting on display a community contrary to every other society in the world, even the USA, even our country. And finally, adopt the practical purpose of love-propelled interaction reactions. Every situation, every encounter we're in, we react in some way or another with others. And we want those to be loving reactions, gracious reactions. Here's what Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another. Be tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. So the do's are this, and there are two. One is wrestle out all the four don'ts. Wrestle out lying and sinful anger and selfish stealing and hoarding and corrosive speech. And these character traits that Paul writes here will follow. You will become kind. You will become tenderhearted. You will become loving. And cultivating the four do's produces that. Over time, over time, these practices and characteristics will follow. In other words, practice the first four helps. The first four helps our spontaneous reactions be filled with love and grace. The less angry you are, the less malice will be in your heart. The more truth you tell, the more forgiveness and kindness will be in your heart. We want to become better imitators of God. Here's another science moment for you. So, uh, uh, there's in every human body, according to scientists, I trust this is true, uh, there's the, every human body hosts 10 microorganisms for every human cell. Think about that, for every human cell in your body. And these contribute to the health of the body. Digestion, 
They produce vitamin K, they promote development of the immune system and detoxify harm, harmful chemicals because coming into the body are all these foreign agents trying to hurt the body. But imagine if, if, if you and I, in practicing these things that Paul writes about, in practicing fidelity to one another, in practicing, in practicing reconciliation with one another, in, in practicing gracious words, in practicing the caring for others' needs, we become a body that's healthier and healthier and healthier. This is the 4th of July for our nation. And I don't want you to think about this as a message of doom and gloom, but a message of great hope. Here's what uh, Dr. John Hanna writes about American history, church history in America. He wrote this, there are some things that should give pause for all of us as we think about the opportunities we have as a Christian people in this nation. FBC Bernie as a Christian people in our country relative to our privileges and our responsibilities to further the witness of Christ's person and work, because that's what we're about. We're to do that right here, right now in our country. The blessings of God on any geographical expression of church, no matter where it is around the world, seem to be related to the sacrificial seriousness with which it relates to our commission as sentinels of the gospel. In other words, as we practice these things together, we have great impact on those outside the church and those around us right here. Both near and abroad. So I think about our opportunity when we go to movie night in Bernie in just a couple of weeks. If we are a closely knit family of believers, think about the opportunity we have for others to see us. And our trips that we've taken, Yucatan and in the DR, those teams and their love for one another and how they had a great impact in those areas on mission. No fooling. We've come to Christ from that old nature. We have sin in us. But we've been put together by divine design in this family. Like each other in many ways, but different in many ways too. But by the Father's design, by the Son's sacrifice, by the Spirit's work, we're being woven together in this beautiful tapestry that's supposed to be on display for the world to see and to want to know God and know his son and be drawn here to be in fellowship with us. So let's roll up our sleeves, FBC Bernie. We, the people of God, striving together by the spirit to form a more perfect unity. Let's roll up our sleeves, work together on truth telling, on keeping short accounts, on aiding others and linguistics, speaking grace to others. Let's be a witness of Christ as God continues through our church right here to be a witness right here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words from Paul's gospel or for Paul's uh, letter to the church of Ephesus. Thank you for the practicality of them for us. Thank you, Lord, um, that uh, you've called us to be here at this time, in this day. Help to form us, Lord. Help to form the bonds of unity through these simple practices and deepen in us who Christ is so that we can be imitators and faithful to the gospel and to one another. Pray these things in Christ's name, amen.